Okay, hello. Thank you for joining us today as we connect with Adam Swanson, our current artist at sea, who is on board research vessel Falcor, sailing in the Northeast Pacific on the Hunting Bubbles expedition. For this research cruise, scientists are using many technologically advanced tools, including remotely operated vehicle Sebastian, to observe, measure, and study deep sea methane seeps. My name is Logan Mockbunning, and I'm on the communications team for Schmidt Ocean Institute. We love participation from all of you watching, so please ask questions. You can ask questions on the YouTube chat bar on the right of your screen, or send tweets with the handle at Schmidt Ocean or hashtag Hunting Bubbles. Please go ahead and post questions now or at any point in this Hangout. We'll be answering questions during a few spots in the presentation and have a set time aside at the end for additional Q&A. To get things rolling, a bit of background. The Schmidt Ocean Institute was established in 2009 with the goal to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through technological innovation, operational support, and open sharing of information. Our research vessel Falcor is equipped with cutting edge technology, including multi-beam sonar and high performance computing systems. SOI's mission statement can be distilled into three words, innovate, explore, share. And we started the Artist at Sea program in late 2015 at the urging of Wendy Schmidt, our founder and vice president to emphasize the last aspect, sharing. Curiosity is not at all limited to the classic left brain stereotype. And in fact, artists are important storytellers and translators helping people to see in new ways. Applying these talents to ocean science and conservation can create a space for dialogue and understanding. Like scientists, artists question, conceptualize, and put together ideas in new ways. Our goal is that the Artist at Sea program will, will result in a different and broader accessibility to the important research occurring on Falcor, and therefore offer a better overall understanding of the complex ocean issues facing us today. We believe that providing a platform where experts from different disciples are brought together, a type of cross-pollination of ideas will transform both the scientists and the artists' work. We look for artists of broad disciplines to work together with scientists and crew. We hope the artists will take inspiration from the research occurring, occurring aboard Falcor, allowing them space and time on the ship to cultivate their creativeness and respond to the research that they are immersed in, using their art to bring science to a broad audience. I hope that this gives a uh, a solid background of our program and also serves as a good launching point for Adam to take over. Adam, would you like to start off by telling us a bit of your background and then give us some insight into what's been happening on the ship, both in terms of research and your artwork? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Logan. Um, yeah, basically, I, I was uh, taken on as an artist in residence here aboard the Falcor, and I, um, I boarded about two weeks ago, I guess, a little more, and um, I guess uh, I've, I've basically just been making artwork. I've been making tons of paintings and meeting with everybody, uh, the science and the, the science personnel, as well as the crew of the Falcor, and making um, uh, basically paintings uh, just based around like the cool stuff they're doing. It's like it's absolutely amazing all the activity that goes on here. And um, for me, it's just uh, I guess fodder for for paintings. Like you know, I could I could make a hundred paintings. Um, oh yeah, um, I guess uh, I, I got I got onto the ship just by applying. Um, it's like a lot of the, the staff and things. I do have background as a uh, on research vessels. When I worked in Antarctica, I, um, there was an MT aboard a research vessel, the Lawrence M. Gould, for a, a couple seasons, I guess, and um, and uh, I worked in Antarctica a bunch. Uh, closely with the vessel uh, uh, prior to that. I'm not, you know, I, uh, it's really fun to be on, on the ship now as, as an artist instead of just a, uh, a marine technician. Uh, that was, uh, it was really cool uh, work uh, being a marine tech and I was uh, you know, able to work uh, closely with the scientists, but as an artist, I can actually make, you know, my own personal work, which is um, really a dream come true, I guess. So uh, basically, there are operations here, morning and nights. Uh, more, you know, starts at about six in the morning often and runs uh, past midnight. Um, I get up at six. We live on the ship. I wake up in the morning and uh, just sort of check check the schedule, see what's going on. There, are, you know, uh, things being deployed all the time. CPD, the ROV, all these uh, happenings and. Um, uh, they set me up with a place in the wet lab, so there's this uh, la laboratory basically where uh, ocean mud comes in and uh, bacteria and seawater and uh, 
life from the ocean floor, uh, all sorts of samples. And there are a group of scientists and researchers there that basically just go through all this stuff. And um, they're running a ton of experiments, which uh, I can get into loosely. I'm no overnight expert, but I have learned quite a lot <clears throat> about uh, methane, the greenhouse gas that they're um, they're hunting for these bubbles, these seeps that sort of uh, express methane from the ocean floor, and they're happening all the time. And I guess uh, we just don't know that much about them. And so this is a, a great opportunity for um, to use the the resources on the Falcor to go and look like really closely at these bubbles, the things that survive survive around them. And um, and yeah, I'm just working kind of right along with everybody. I have my space in the wet lab. I run around and I take photographs. They've been um, just like super cool about letting me poke my nose in anywhere pretty much. Uh, I, I just sort of have to follow all the safety precautions and everything, but generally I have been um, really, really welcomed as sort of like a member of the, of the crew. And, um, and I'm able to basically take photographs use um, the, the small amount of panels and canvases that I brought with, I think I brought eight, um, and, um, and make and make paintings based kind of off those photographs and my experiences. And, and all the while, uh, science and the research and all this stuff is just swirling around me, you know, as I make these paintings. And so it's like, it's probably the best, uh, the best kind of situation to make. Uh, it's like a little bit plain air in, in a way, in that way, so. Um, yeah, I guess that that's sort of like the, the brief overview of of what it is I'm doing here. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about. bit about the screens that are going on behind you? Again, maybe give a little intro to uh, to what. Oh what yeah, yeah, like to. Um, yeah. In a dream world, I'd be able to take this camera off the ceiling and wander around the ship. But um, uh, you can see a lot here. I guess like here's uh basically the the aft deck of the ship where we launch the, uh, the ROV um, and basically Sebastian, this uh, robot that crawls around the, uh, the ocean floor or hovers around the ocean floor is, um, is sort of dropped here. And, um, and this is sort of a live camera view of it basically right now. It is at the ocean floor, and uh, you can see this is sort of what's going on down there. You can actually stream this on YouTube. Schmidt, Schmidt Ocean has a great uh, live feed of everything that goes on down there. And right now it's possibly a little bit um, mellow because they're trying to, to, to photograph these bubbles as they hydrate, which means they get form kind of an icy shell around them. But um, I mean, you can see all the bubbles. Maybe you can't. I'm not. I'm not sure how good the resolution is. But they're just bubbles, like you know, coming up just from the ocean floor. It's it's nuts. But um, so this is what's going on on the ocean floor. About uh, a, what, half of a mile deep or something. I think it's like 800 meters right now. And um, this is the deck view. This is sort of the the path of the ROV. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's basically it, it, it wanders around until they find these bubbles and then um, then they mark a point and they say, OK, you know, there's some bubbles here. Let's go look around. Sometimes they'll capture uh, samples or um, take measurements of some kind. And, you know, it's a little bit of a hunt, you know, because the, the bubbles exist, but they turn on and off according to the pressure and, and a variety of reasons that are as yet unknown, really. And um, and basically, uh, this is our this is our I think our third location. It's called Hydrate Ridge, and um, we just arrived here yesterday early morning. And uh, yeah, I guess this is just sort of the trail uh, of the ROV underwater that it makes through the day. And then you can kind of see it tells us I guess you know the depth, and you know these screens are all over. It's in my in my bedroom and in. Uh, in the kitchen, so it's kind of cool. No matter where you are, uh, the galley or something, you can you can always look up and see see what's going on around you. And then that's uh, Logan <laughs> on that screen. Hey Adam, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Is that ROV tethered to the ship? Does the ship stay in the same place as that's moving around? Yeah. Come 
Yeah, definitely. Is this Tom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. Hey. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, it is tethered to the ship. There is a cable with uh, fiber optics and power running through it, and really long. I don't even know how long. Seven. 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 Um, and so, anyways, it is. Uh, it is tethered to the ship and uh, remotely controlled in, or in this control room that we have aboard the ship with about thirty screens the size of this and a number of pilots and um, and then the science team sort of directing movements and you know oh let's go grab that starfish or let's capture these bubbles and you know right now they're they're trying to take some uh, high resolution photographs of the bubbles and how they form and how they move in the water so uh, yeah it's, it's a really cool place actually the control room it's just sort of uh, a really dark room with a ton of computer screens, and then the ROV being attached to the ship is controlled with these, I don't know, these sort of little joystick things. It's more like, it seems more like playing an instrument than actually managing a joystick, but they're very uh, responsive. So there's like a person sort of moving these armatures around and directing the ROV, you know, where, where it sort of goes. It has propellers and it just sort of uh, hovers around and it is connected, though, to the ship. So just to go in a little bit more depth with that, we do also use autonomous vehicles. Um, on this cruise, I believe we have a lander, which is something that we sort of send down to the bottom, and it sits and waits. I think we're testing it um, for future usage. Um, but uh, as Adam said, the ROV, that stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, and that means it does indeed have a tether or an umbilical. Um, but there are times that we definitely use different types of robot robotics, especially autonomous vehicles. And those are ones that we put in the water that are not attached to the ship, that are programmed to perform a mission and then come back to the ship and give us data. The advantage of having a remotely operated vehicle is that we're seeing it all in real time. As Adam said, the umbilical has, um, along with taking the power and controls, it also has uh, audio visual capabilities. So, um, if our researchers see something that they want to, that they want, they can immediately ask the pilot, um, "Hey, like Adam said, let's do, go take a sample of that." Whereas if you have an autonomous uh, vehicle, a lot of times it goes out, performs its mission, and then comes back, and we have to react to that data after it's already been processed. And with a, rem a remotely operated vehicle, it's real time. Um, as Adam also said, you can go onto our YouTube page and see these uh, these streams, these expeditions happening in real time. Um, part of, again, our, our goal of sharing is putting all the information out into the world. And so not only can you see what's happening now, but you can look back through our archive and see hours and hours and hours and hours of uh, expeditions footage that we've done in the past. So all of this is available to the public. Um, and some of it is, is really, really interesting and striking. Um, and it kind of depends on what you like. You know, um, Personally, I, I, I watch the bubbles for a while and it's really interesting, but it's not something I'm gonna watch for hours and hours. Um, however, we do have people that, that watch the chemistry expeditions for all day and then others who tune in more especially for coral exploration, exploration or, or different biological seeking. So it really depends on what you're interested in. Um, one of the nice things about the ROV is it can be customized to perform science for lots of different specialties. Sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to take over, but Again, we are a technological-based organization, so when somebody's interested, I want to make sure that we give them the information. No, I love it. That's great. Um, yeah, are there any other questions anybody has right now? So how big is the ship you're on? How big is the ship? Uh, the ship is 80 meters. Uh, so I, I think it's it's quite big. I think. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, and um, I think there are 30 or 40 people can can live aboard. That seems this is sort of a, a rough estimate. I'm not 100% sure on that. But um, yeah, it has uh, basically a number of floors. I just toured the engine room this morning. Um, it's really enormous, and it can go anywhere in the world. Uh, it is. Uh, a very sleek and sturdy vessel. We've had some some wild seas, but uh, it hasn't been uh, too rocky, I guess. 
So is this ship out all the time, or does it? Do you have designated <coughs> surveys? You know, how long are you? How long are you going to be out for? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. I think, it, from what I understand, most most of the crew works like a two month contract, so they'll work two months on and then two months off, and then come back again. Um, I am just on for three weeks, so I I boarded in Astoria, Oregon, and we just went out basically into the Pacific Ocean, and I will get dropped off in um, Newport, Oregon, um, and the ship is going to carry on toward uh, San Francisco, and I. I think even can tell after that, but they will, they're going to be uh, docked or in port in San Francisco for a while and have uh, some events. And I think kind of like a science on deck, sort of like the uh, Blue Heron in Duluth has uh, at the Exploratorium in San Francisco uh, toward the end of this month. But I, I won't be here for that. I'm just here for three, three weeks um, as an artist and resident. Does it focus on the Pacific Ocean or does it go elsewhere? Um, it, it goes elsewhere, yes. Uh, they, they, um, they go to Hawaii, the Arctic. Um, uh, Logan probably could give you a better history than I can, but um, I mean, most of the people here have been um, working on the ship for years and years, and they've uh, been all around the world. Yeah, one of the, uh, one of the interesting things about Falcor is that we don't have a home port. Um, our mission is to give access to scientists um, to get them out at sea and doing research as much as possible. So we spend as much time as possible out at sea. Um, to get to the, the most recent question, um, we have been in the Pacific the last few years. Um, we're able to go anywhere and a lot of times, uh, we like, like Adam said, we have done research um, in very cold places and in the North Atlantic. Um, we recently, just because of logistics, since we have transited over to the Pacific, Again, we're trying to make the most of the time uh, we have and at sea. So a lot of times when we, when we take in these proposals from scientists, we not only look at what they're doing and how this will help science and advanced technology, but also the logistics of it. Um, the Pacific Ocean and the oceans in general are a really big place. So a lot of times in order to maximize what we're doing, it's easier uh, or just more efficient to stay within kind of a prescribed area. But we have the capability to go everywhere and uh, in fact, that is one of our goals is to really explore the places and go to the places that haven't been researched a lot. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Mm -hmm. Is the Falcor your only ship or are there more? It is currently the only ship. Um, we did have a ship in the past um, and I don't know how, how pop culture savvy the audience is, but does anybody recognize the name Falcor? <laughs> Uh, it's from uh, it's from the the German story. Uh, sorry, the German uh, child's book, The Neverending Story. It was a, a big movie in the eighties. Um, and Falcor is a luck dragon who is sort of the the flying transportation for a lot of the main characters. Um, so that is sort of the metaphor here that that hopefully uh, we are not only doing good things but taking good place good people to good places. Um, so yeah, but to answer your question, right now we only have one ship, and that is Falcor. I have a question about the long-term goal of studying the methane levels. Is it climate change or what? Well, um, I can't one hundred percent answer this, but I, um, I I would say that uh, the long-term goal is just to know and learn more about them. I think uh, it has it's like a an area of science that hasn't really been studied, though it's thought that these plumes have been. Uh, you know, spouting for, you know, millions of years, uh, but we just haven't, uh, haven't really known because we didn't have the capability and technology to, to see and measure them and the areas around them. Um, also, like a very uh, large portion of the Earth's methane is stored under the ocean, and it is a very uh, potent greenhouse gas. So uh, I think the scientists are interested. I mean, just it, since it is a greenhouse gas, they they're interested to know, oh, you know, does how much of it makes it to the surface of the ocean, what factors affect, you know, how high the methane rises before it just sort of dissolves and becomes a part of the chemistry of the water. And um, and then also, how does it affect the life around it? I mean, there are actually a number of different uh, research projects going on on this vessel right now 
that have to do with the methane uh, bubbles, and uh, I wouldn't say all of them are are directly related to one another. They all have, uh, have, have some some different angles, but um, you know the the methane acts as food for a lot of uh, these these creatures um, underwater. You, you know, you hear about these uh, animals that live you know near deep sea vents, and they get a lot of their their nutrients and things from that. Whereas, like you know, most of the life on Earth, most of life on Earth gets its energy from from the sun. But there are uh, are living organisms that, that don't see the sun, and so they either get it indirectly, or um, or taking nutrients from um, things like these methane uh, seeps. So uh, I guess to answer your question, the long-term goal of this is just to learn more about uh, methane and how these plumes and these seeps are affecting the local area around where the gas is, is expressed, and then beyond that, where does it go afterwards? So Adam did a great job of explaining that. I'm gonna add one other little aspect to it, which uh, is just something that I find really interesting. Like Adam explained, most life on Earth, uh, as, as we knew it for, for centuries, was photosynthetic. It, it was based on energy from the sun, um, plants taking that energy and creating cellulose and therefore growing, and then animals eating that plant, those plants, and so on and so forth. Um, about 30 years ago, with the discovery of hydrothermal vents, um, that really radically upended the way we understood life to exist. And it introduced to us the idea of chemosynthesis, which is, as Adam said, animals surviving and, and feeding off of chemicals uh, and, and instead of basing their energy on their input of, from the energy of the sun. And so with this chemosynthetic model, um, as he mentioned, there's a lot of life and, and food web that is based on the chemicals and then smaller um, bacteria or, or other smaller organisms feed off that and have different, different um, relationships, whether they be symbiotic or actually feeding upon each other. Um, but to get to the, the point that I find so interesting, it, it, is, it is widely believed that if we do find life on other planets or other moons, for example, um, the icy moon of Io, uh, the way the first type of life that we will probably encounter will be something that is chemosynthetic, that is based off of a hydrothermal or uh, a cold seep vent at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, life will be based upon the input of energy and chemicals from these sources. Uh, a lot of these moons are covered or these planets are covered either completely in liquid or in an icy shell. And so therefore the belief, the, the theory is that um, the basis of life, instead of being based on the sun, as most of we know is, will be actually based upon some sort of deep sea, again, either hydrothermal vent or cold sea. So studying not just the chemistry that Adam talked about, but also the biology of how different organisms survive, thrive, and, and proliferate um, and are, are related to others is a really, uh, really interesting aspect to a lot of different types of scientists. Um, it's, it's sort of funny to think that the deep sea is almost a training ground for a lot of the astro exploration, astrobiology, astrochemistry, um, but it's actually the closest place that we can look at similar environments or what we think will be similar environments. Um, and again, Adam, I apologize, I kind of hijacked that, uh, but it really is a, it, it's one of the best ways, I think, to, uh, to give an example of how deep sea research is not just some people who are curious and looking at something just for the heck of it, but there really is a lot of applicable um, fields and, um, and different ways that this information and knowledge will be utilized in the future. Yeah, that's great. I have a question for Adam. Adam, so, um, so obviously you're out there, I assume you're probably learning a ton the whole time that you're out there. Has there been like a particular moment where some new knowledge or some new information has like inspired you to either immediately get to action and try to capture it and or change something that you had already started trying to paint? Um, um that's a good question. I, um, I mean, I guess every day here has been just like, yeah, this whirlwind of uh, inspiring stuff going on. Um, really specifically, I guess uh, I have been sort of called to immediate action with um, with some of the stuff just dealing with the, the ROV, because uh, that is unlike anything I've ever even 
really come close to uh, seeing, you know, in action, kind of behind the scenes in the control room, and then uh, on deck, you know, like when they're, where, I mean, I'm helping sometimes, like take the samples off and bring them into the lab for processing and, and, um, and making these decisions. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, initially I, I thought that, you know, when I signed, when I accepted this position as an artist, uh, I, I thought it was going to be a little bit more about the greenhouse gas aspect of methane, but um, I'm learning more about, yeah, this, uh, the way life is, is formed and sort of the important uh, stuff uh, surrounding the, these questions. Yeah, like these, these animals and creatures, uh, this life that, that exists at the bottom, at the bottom of the sea on, on chemicals, you know, not, not just the sun. So, um, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, I've sort of been drawn to painting the, the ROV uh, vehicle a little bit more than, than I would have thought, just because I, I feel like this is it, you know, like, I'm not sure I'm going to be a, shaking hands with a, a giant robot like that anytime real soon. So um, it's just very inspiring to see like the amount of, uh, of work that goes into it. And then I guess the other thing that's just occurring to me is uh, I made a lot of my paintings about sort of the impro improvisation that goes on here. I mean, obviously, these projects are very well thought out, years in the making, and the technology has been tr tested and tried and true. But there are just these little things that go wrong, and, and we're all stuck on a ship, and there's no uh, hardware store down the lane. So, you know, you'll find, uh, the, you know, there's like there are people just welding things together and bungee cord and there's a milk crate on the ROV where you know when things don't fit in this bio box you know they just stuff it and bungee cord it you know into this milk crate and uh, I just love that so much yeah, it's sort of just people are solving problems as they go and you think of it as this uh, it's almost like uh, you know you have a project you design it and then you expect it to go off flawlessly but inevitably in a, a place like this. Uh, you have to troubleshoot problems, and you're sort of forced to do it even more creatively than you would do on land, you know, where you can go buy, buy supplies. So that has been really inspiring to me and, and affected a lot of my paintings. I painted a lot of, um, I'm making a couple of them right now, but even in some of my lab paintings are just like weird things, you know, like, oh, our suction device isn't handling the mud well. So they, you know, went and got a, a salad dressing bottle from the kitchen, and uh, there's and that works, you know, it's just um, really interesting to see the adaptability, you know, that's always been sort of something I've been interested in and uh, seeing the kind of adaptability that people here are are displaying is, is awesome and cool. And it actually makes these, um, these instruments that are just sort of uh, equal parts high tech and ramshackle, you know, you have a lot of um, duct tape and bungee cords and um, really expensive electronics all mingled together. Can yeah. you show us some of your photo or your your pictures and tell us about them? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can. I brought a bunch of paintings in. I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure you'll probably be able to see them a little, you know, pretty well. But yeah. So this is the biggest one I did. It's a. Uh, it's kind of a. Uh, the ROV, it's sort of like uh, when I was in Astoria, we were on the ship for two days, kind of doing safety and introductions and things. And um, I had time to run to a hardware store and sort of get some more uh, larger panels than that would fit in my, um, um, that would then would fit in my, my luggage. So um, this is one, I'm not sure, can you see it at all? That's great. Okay, here's one. And then I made about six paintings so far. Um, you know, if you want to see electronic images, you can kind of see them. You know, I've been posting them on Facebook and my web, not my website, but Facebook at least. Just rough photos that I've taken on the deck with my phone. Um, here my good friend Kevin here is going to hold them up for everybody to see. But um, basically that one is just uh, ROV team crew just putting putting the Sebastian the hat to a never-ending story uh, as Bastion, if you 
not familiar with the movie. It was the name of the little boy who was reading the books. Anyways, um, what's this one? This one's kind of an underwater scene I painted from the live cam view of the ROV as it was collecting some samples. And it was a very dramatic moment where the sea star escaped and uh, Sebastian was rolling around the ocean floor trying to catch catch the sea star, but then we ended up letting him go because I think everybody was sort of rooting for the rooting for the little guy. Um, all right, here's another. This is a C CTD rosette, which I have painted before when I worked as a marine technician on the, the Gould in Antarctica. I deployed this a lot, but then um, also on the Blue Heron and on Lake Superior, I, I, I've always loved CTDs, uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. Uh, they, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they, uh, they basically collect water. They just, they, they feel like they're so useful and you can use them for a million things. And, and uh, I have this one more that's sort of in progress. I'll just show it to you real quick. But, you know, working in the wet lab, I literally just can turn around and paint the things that are right in front of me. I mean, I'm still working from photographs a fair, a fair amount, but, um, we're all just here together. You know, it's, it's like, it's sort of like if you live and work in one, a building and you just never leave. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's awesome. Like you're sort of like you're, uh, you know, having breakfast with, uh, the captain, the engineer and the grad student. And, you know, it's like a really nice, uh, interesting, uh, diverse mix of people from all around the world. Um, uh, so it's great, Adam, I guess, you know, whenever I have a question. Yeah. I was just going to say, I've actually got a few photos of you working in the wet lab and a couple images that uh, you and Kevin sent me earlier. Is it okay if I screen share and, and show them sort of full frame with the space you're talking about and a couple examples of your work? Will that be all right? Oh, please do. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah. Let me... Let me enable the screen sharing here. And can you all see me? Are you all able to see the screen? Yeah, we are. Thank you. All right. So here, uh, Adam, if you want to sort of uh, talk about what they're seeing here on the screen, um, maybe that would yeah, be helpful. Yeah, um, this is, yeah, that's Oops. great. Uh, that uh, one that you just had. It's um, yeah. Just a sec. Yeah, that's basically my studio space, and um, it's awesome. It's in the wet lab, so kind of in the background. Uh, as Izzy, uh, she works um, right, kind of right on that those, that corner counter over there, and I'm kind of also right next to a sink. You can you can you can't really see it. I guess my that blue thing is my palette. Um, but every now and then, you know the. The uh, researchers will be processing a, a ton of mud, and you know I'll need to shuffle my my palette over, and um, it's awesome. I like really love that kind of thing because it makes me feel like I'm really like in in the mix of everything. And so yeah, basically I've just been making. I, I brought a bunch of panels from home, the the size that would fit in my luggage, and so I'm working a little bit smaller, but um, it's really bright in there, and. Um, I take photos, I brought my iPad, so I've been looking at that for reference photos. And again, I, uh, I've been given pretty much free license to just wander around the entire ship as long as I'm being safe and communicating with people, you know, where I'm going and when. And, uh, and everybody seems really open with talking about the research and uh, the, the goings on of the ship as well, like what, what it is that, you know, that they're doing and why. And so, yeah, this is my studio, basically. It's like, it's really close to the outside, so it's a really nice place for fresh air. I take like five steps, and then I can be on the on the aft deck where um, they load and unload the ROV, and there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of other things happening out there, but it's like uh, a very active place, I guess. There is also a dry lab where some of the more, like, temperature and humidity sensitive things go, but this is where I am at is very, uh, the biological and the uh, chem chemical sciences are, are spinning all around all the time. So you can kind of see my setup there. I brought my little plain air easel and my brushes and, uh, and my paints from home, I guess. So yeah, that's just it. When I got to Astoria, I had lost my varnish uh, to the airport. So um, thankfully there's a little art store in pick up a couple extra supplies and things but um 
yeah, it's just been uh, just a dream. Uh, I forgot to bring a white colored pencil, but somebody here had one. You know, it's just like a, it's definitely a community, and and it's yeah, it's great. There's a library here. That's where I'm talking right now. Um, there's a printer. There's internet. It's like a little patchy and somewhat slow. So like transferring large photos and things can be difficult. But it's uh, it's actually amazing that there is internet because when I worked on the Gould in Antarctica, we'd get like maybe like 20 minutes of internet a day, and it was just enough to get our email. So actually having this live chat right now even though there's probably a slight time delay and the footage is a little grainy, it's, um, it's just amazing. <laughs> so you talked about the uh, crew and the other staff in your location. Oh. Have you had to do that with any of your patrons? <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat the question? So you mentioned that the crew has to uh, innovate sometimes because of your circumstances. Have you had to do any of that kind of thing with your painting supplies or techniques? With what supplies? With my painting supplies? Or techniques, yeah. Oh, oh have I had to? <laughs> um, is that what you're asking? Have I had to innovate or adapt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um, in your home studio. Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, working here is totally different than working in my home studio. I mean, the space alone is, is really different. You know, when I um, I don't have back frames for some of my paintings just because I, I didn't I couldn't fit them in my luggage. It was overweight. But uh, um, so, you know, just like thinking about, oh, how am I going to display these? How am I going to hang them? Space on the ship. I mean, it looks pretty wide open in here, but there's, um, you know, there's not just a lot of space to like lean things against the wall. You know, you can't hammer a nail in the wall to to hang your paintings. Um, thankfully, I really thought through my supplies quite a lot, but um, so I didn't, you know, I remembered all my brushes and paints and everything. I did forget the white colored pencil, but um, thankfully somebody had that. Um, you know, everything's a little different, like just treating my wastewater. I don't just dump it right down the drain. I've been dumping it into this larger barrel and then sort of waiting and letting it settle and there's a waste barrel and then uh it just uh it's like similar but different i guess it reminds me a little bit more of when i um you know every year i do a plain air painting retreat in the boundary waters in uh in northern minnesota and it reminds me a little bit more of, of that where you kind of just like well this is what you have and you kind of have to have to make it work but i, ha I haven't had any crazy malfunction, you know, I kind of thought, oh, you know, what if my easel breaks or something, but like I said, there's a whole shop here with, you know, people who know how to weld and and everything, so um, I I have been, you know, I, I'm going to run out of panels, actually, so I did talk to some of the ship's crew, and they have given me some, like, you know, they're funny, just sheets of random stuff, like some metal, old scrap metal planks and uh, plastic things, and so, I, you know, I'm, I'm Honestly, uh, have no shortage of, of, of things to paint on, that's for sure. <laughs> Adam, is there anything that you haven't captured yet that you're looking forward to painting? Is there some ideas you got ahead of you that you're working on? Oh, gosh, you know, I um, there are a bunch. I'm not going to have enough time probably to do all the, well, definitely to do all the paintings I want to do. I would... Um, I guess initially I came on here thinking, oh, I'm going to paint a bunch of the high tech gear, you know, and then because um, and the science going on with the people, of course, you know, that's such a an important aspect. But um, the more I I thought about it, I, I started to realize that this whole ship is basically like one piece of scientific equipment, and um, and you know, uh, I yeah, I could almost do like a, a picture of every single member of the crew doing something, you know. I, I was thinking of I'd like to do a a painting of the of the kitchen, actually, the, the cooks and chefs and uh, in the kitchen, just because uh, they're like maybe one of the most important aspects of the ship, but uh, we don't really, uh, I don't, you know, you don't always think of that as like being a sort of a piece of all this science rolling. Um, so if I can fit that in, I'm going to, I'd like to do another, I'd like, you know, it'd be great to do another 
underwater scene with bubbles and um, an ROV doing cool stuff. I just love love painting that. Um, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I, I'm going to make probably eight or nine paintings on board this vessel, which is a lot for three weeks. But I'm going to uh, take all this home with me, and I will be painting pictures based on this experience for the next year or two, no matter what. I mean, sure, you know, not maybe only that, but uh, it's been... Um, I have taken a ton of photographs and a lot of notes and and have, have a ton of ideas. Um, I only have two, yeah, one or two more uh, panels, I guess, left, but one of them's a big one. So I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to figure out which, which that, which is, you know, what I'm gonna paint on there. But um, yeah, that was a little bit of a ramble, but I guess uh, as a, uh, that's kind of my, my thought. I mean, there are a million things I, I wanna paint. I love to paint the kitchen and I'd love to paint some more underwater scenes. And yeah, and just some classic, you know, everything here is basically for science. So uh, everything that goes on is fair game. And it's uh, every direction I look, there's something that would make a good painting. Adam, the screen yeah. behind you seems to suggest that there's some uh, action to that bolt and you seem to be standing there very easily are you finding that that's anything that makes it more difficult to paint sorry what was that last, that last part it kind of broke up just a little bit are you finding, are you finding that the, <laughs> the action of the bolt makes it any more difficult to paint oh yeah yeah yeah, that's good. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, the boat definitely does rock. I mean, even now, you know, like there's like constantly a little bit of sway. I, I mean, I have to um, bungee cord my uh, whole easel to the table. You can probably see it in those photos, but um, everything like I bungee cord all my paints and my tray down. I tape my tray, tray my palettes to the, the table. Um, all my paintings, I have to worry, you know, like I actually clip them in at night before I go to sleep because um yeah the boat is pitching all the time and swaying and rocking and um stuff falls over you know uh, so um you know for me standing there there have been lots of times where i'm in the lab and i like i don't fall over you know but i definitely have to grab the grab the um countertop so that i don't fall over sort of thing but you know it's kind of nice i mean uh i like it it sort of keeps me keeps me moving i guess sort of um, now I hardly even notice it, I guess, but for the first few days, it was sort of reacclimating to life on a ship. Um, you know, another thing is just looking out the window, you know, and you see like the, the horizon line, it's just goes up past the door and then down past the edge of the ship where you can't even see it anymore. And that's, uh, you know, you can maybe get a little sense of it with this computer monitor, though the camera's high, I probably won't quite do it justice, but, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's always moving. You know, I've been doing some yoga and exercises just because we can't, you know, run down to the mailbox or whatever, go for a long bike ride. So, um, you know, that's like a funny thing, you know, to do balancing yoga poses while the ship's uh, tilting. I mean, everybody falls over all the time. It's just like, it's just the, the name of the game, I guess. Um, yeah. Question? Um, yeah. How has the crew and the scientists reacted to your paintings when they've looked at them? What's been their reaction? Yeah, I would say they have been really supportive. It's been amazing. Like I kind of thought that um, I was be like, you know, like a little bit of an outsider since I didn't have like a really uh, particular mission. And, you know, we're all here for science and the crew is here to support science, you know, but there's really not that much about art written into that little description. So I just kind of wondered um, you know, how I'd be received, and especially because, uh, you know, I, I paint things, you know, how they look, but I definitely have a style and it's a little loose and everything. And I guess I just wasn't sure like what people would think and, um, of me trying to paint the place where they live and they know so well, but, uh, everybody has been so nice. It is unbelievable. Uh, people come into the wet lab and they look at the stuff and, um, you know, people, are just, I gave a presentation on my paintings, you know, and I, sh I showed them a ton of my older work and kind of what brought me to, to here. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, I can't tell you how supportive everybody's been. It's been like really unbelievable. And even the crew who, you know, know this ship 
and love it and the work here and it's their um you know it's their home as, as well as their place of work they uh they are just so welcoming and like oh yeah come look at this you know you want to go down and look at the engine room you want to you know come help do something it's uh it's they've been really supportive and i think they want they want cool art and people have, have seemed to uh sort of respect the the place of art in a place like this where you know it's just like another adds another voice to all the cool stuff going on here besides just the raw data and human relationships that come out of it so uh, are you in a series of artists that have been on there is it ongoing this project yeah it is um there are artists here a lot um usually it's just one at a time um but um, I think that there has been more than one at, at, for shorter cruises, sounds like. But um, yeah, basically, this is um, something that people apply to. And um, other, you know, if you're interested, you, you should apply. It is a, it's an amazing experience. And, uh, and everything is, uh, they, you know, they go out of their way to try to help, help people. And they don't just have painters. You know, they have musical artists and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that's been knit and crocheted around here, uh, photographs, uh, printmakers, drawers. I think someone told me there was like a dancer. So, you know, you get electronics artists, uh, kinetic sculpture, that sort of thing. Um, there have been, like, qu I think, quite a, a wide array of types of artists. Um, and even some painters that are just, uh, sounds like very abstract, you know, not even uh, like me painting stuff that kind of looks like what it is, you know, more... Uh, yeah, there have been writers, po poet, poets on board. Yeah, so it's open to artists. They actually encourage, which is not extremely common, I think, for, for a research vessel, but um, but it's a great opportunity. So just to jump in on that, uh, you can see, as Adam said, we've got a lot of different folks uh, aboard, and you can go online to www.schmidtocean.org and check out our previous Artists at Sea um, folks. We have not only the blogs they've written about their experiences, but we have galleries up of the work that they've done. We also have traveling exhibits. Um, we've only done a few, but we have a couple more in the works where we travel to different locations and spotlight both the science and, and the art that have come from the artists being on board. So, uh, and, and as Adam mentioned earlier, we've also been posting some of his work uh, on Facebook and Instagram um, and Twitter, I believe as well. For all of that, we're at Schmidt Ocean. Um, and then for our website is www.schmidtocean.org. So um, if you wanna just do a quick search for Artists at Sea and Schmidt Ocean Institute, that'll definitely get, the, get you there. Or you can go straight to our website at schmidtocean.org and click on the apply and artist at sea. It also has information about how to apply. We have an annual call around the end of the year, um, November, December, we haven't actually announced yet, um, but we do encourage folks of all disciplines to apply and come uh, come visit us on. Yeah, all right, does anybody have any, any more questions? I have a question, Adam. Um, as you're yep. traveling now out there in the water, and this isn't the first large body of water that you've been on, this is, you know, you've been on a lot of water, really. Has your idea of color changed at all as to um, acuity or vividness or context or anything like that as you're, as you're um, experiencing this you now massive body of water that you're on and um, work environment and in this environment that seems to be uh, global inclusive of helping um, by um, giving out information as to the environment. So I'm just wondering, that's probably a big question, but <laughs> I was wondering yeah. your Yeah, that's fine. No, I, I get it. Um, yeah, my, I, my, I've been loving, you know, playing with the colors here. I mean, I guess I really have blown through my white and blue and Thalo green, you know, it's like, uh, since it's, since most of the subject matter here is, are things that I'm not actually that familiar with. I mean, I know what a horizon of water looks like in the sky pretty well, but almost everything I've painted has been like 
you know, a little bit out of my my wheelhouse. Um, not you know, not counting that recent uh, work group of science paintings that I I did that is hanging in Duluth Pottery right now. But um, you know, some some of that is somewhat similar. But I've really uh, tried hard to keep the colors like a little bit more true to life. I think you know, if I do um, if I do another iteration of a painting, for example, if I did another version of this uh, CTD painting or something, I might, you know, feel feel inspired to push, you know, push the colors a little bit harder and see, you know, what what I could do to play around with. But um, but it's been like a really fun exercise, honestly, just to kind of keep it a little bit more basic and true to life, even though it's not exactly true to life, but it's um, it's possibly a little closer. I mean, there are so many subtle color changes. I mean, like the these lab. Uh, lab paintings that I, I've been doing have been really like gray and a different kind of gray and then a little bit of yellowish gray and then sort of a bluish gray and you know it's like uh, working with within that sort of very simple somewhat monochromatic uh, color field really makes like the small amount of colors you know that you do put in pop and uh, I guess in, in a lot of my work I feel like sometimes I can get you know, a little bit crazier with color. So um, it's nice to actually have something a little bit more muted. And um, yeah, I mean, it's all, all a grand experiment, I guess. I'm enjoying the, the colors here for sure. Has your experience um, influenced or, or changed any direction that you want to take um, with your art or uh, how you interact with our community uh, moving forward? Well, I would really, I mean, honestly, this has really, um, confirmed my, or maybe you want to double down on this, uh, the, the work on just the cool science that's been going on around uh, me. It, it had always kind of been just sort of a, a side project, you know, in between my commission work and um, some gallery sales and things, but um, I'm just going to really keep pressing this. I mean, even uh, the work that's in Duluth Pottery right now, I, I feel like I barely scratched the surface of all those places that I visited, and, um, and being here, uh, makes me realize like how much energy and um, insight and uh, I guess just cool research and science that uh, it affects our lives, you know, in great uh, profound ways. It goes around, goes on all the time around us, and um, you know, as an artist, uh, the artist side of me is uh, really interested in. And painting about the things I'm interested in, and so this has made me sort of want to just really dive deeper, especially when I get home to like do another series of paintings that, that I have to do with the, the cool science going on, especially with you know I, I'm interested in water quality and uh, and you know climate change and just sort of uh, yeah all, all all sorts of stuff I guess, but uh, but the stuff is happening, and um, it's nice to add an artist's voice to to the data and and the numbers and the things that are already out there. Science question. <laughs> I mean, from Lucas. I, yeah, uh, I checked out the video earlier about the Chasing Bubbles mission or cruise, and they mentioned your the ship is working on the Astoria Trench, 800 meters deep, yeah. and I don't know, 100 a couple hundred kilometers up from the coast. Yet there's a signal from the Columbia River that that affects the methane. I don't know if Lucas knows anything about that. I was real curious to hear that there's a signal from shore that, that the ship, those scientists are seeing that far out and that deep. Um, from what I understand, there uh, is some issues with uh, metallic, I don't want to say contamination, um, but traces of metals that do come from the flow of, of the river. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. Um, I don't think so much uh, of the readings that they've gotten from from re river input has been straight methane, um, but there have been other aspects that again affect the life around the seeps. Um, a lot of life needs um, iron and other metals to actually metabolize and and create energy via different chemical reactions. Um, and so one of the very, very limiting factors of life around oceans is the even though they're tiny, tiny concentrations, um, uh, bits of, of metallic compounds that can allow 
um, bacteria and other life to actually process different chemicals. Um, and that was something that they were, were very interested in and, uh, and is in our last video review. Um, every week we put out different weekly updates as well as a, a wrap up video of the entire cruise. And part of the, the, the aspects that were discussed in the last um, video dealt with some of the, the metals and river runoff and how that affects life being able to, to again, thrive in these areas that are very, very extreme, very, very cold, um, very little to no sunlight um, and under a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, so there are, again, lots and lots of different aspects that come into making um, life possible in, in these areas. Is the methane on the bottom, is that liquid or is it solid? So one of the, the aspects that they're looking at is there are different forms of methane. And so these seeps uh, are coming from what's called a methane hydrate. And that is when in certain conditions, um, notably under a lot of pressure and very cold environments, methane can form something very similar to an ice. It's a crystalline structure, kind of a lattice where it actually, the gas becomes a solid. Um, again, it's not exactly ice, but that's the best metaphor that I can think of for it. And so there are these hydrate fields where um, these form, this form of methane is a solid that is underneath a lot of sediment and in the ground. And as conditions change generally through heat, um, but also through different, you know, maybe geological activity or other aspects, the, the gas form of methane can be freed from these hydrates. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yes. Well, so we're, we're working up on an hour now. If we have one or two questions to finish things up, that would be perfect for our time. Is there a great release of methane in the form of gas? I'm sorry, I could barely hear you far in the back. Is there a, a large uh, release of methane in the form of gas on occasion? Well, that is, again, part of the thing that they're, they're looking for. Um, as Adam said earlier, a lot of this is, uh, although these were known features, how they actually work is very unknown. Um, and so when you look through, when researchers look through the geological record, there are times where it appears there are massive spikes of different, um, different uh, environments and, and different gases and different um, atmospheric conditions. And one of the questions they have is whether this um, this methane is released all at once occasionally, or if it is more of sort of a, a lot of times the deep ocean is referred to as a carbon sink um, in that organisms can take in carbon dioxide and then when they die, they sink down to the bottom. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of carbon and other elements that are sort of stored at the bottom of the ocean through the cycle of life um, and rising and falling. And so what you're asking is a very, very good question and I don't think anybody really knows the answer yet. And that's part of what this is studying is how do these things happen? How do they change? Is it a small thing piece by piece? And if there are big events, what would that look like? How would that work? And how would that affect both the ocean and the atmosphere? So it's a wonderful question. I'm afraid I, I don't know if anyone knows the answer quite yet. Thank you. So maybe I'll ask one final question to Adam. Uh, uh, you like to paint robots. Uh, are, are your interactions with Sebastian and some of these other things going to influence uh, your painting of robots in the future? Uh, sorry, what was that last part of that question? I said I know you like to paint robots, and I'm wondering if Sebastian is going to influence your painting of robots in the future. Totally, yeah. Thank, yeah, that's great. Um, great question. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. So, you know, I've been, I spent a lot of my early years um, painting like toy robots and stuff because I like the idea of them more than anything. But um, interacting with Sebastian has been amazing and uh, kind of makes me think a little bit more uh, seriously about spending more of my time painting like ac like actual robots that are happening that, that actually do stuff, <laughs> you know, not, not just the kind of toy kind from science fiction. I mean, I still love those, and I, I probably will paint those. But um, you know, I did a series of, of the Mars rover paintings, and um, I think this is sort of the next step of that for me. You know, this is a little bit more real. I have actually experience um, living with and working with uh, this kind of robot, and um, yeah, I'm excited to learn more about other other 
ways that we use uh, technology to sort of act as our our body and our eyes and ears, and um, and just paint paint little snapshots and stories about those things. Well, we want to thank you for joining us here. Yes. 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 Yeah, well, thank you everybody for coming out. I know it's like uh, um, probably a nice September day in Duluth, and it's uh, really cool that you all came came out for this. It means means a lot to me, and uh, I'm really excited uh, to get to get back home, I guess, and and just carry on and, and paint. And uh, likewise, to everybody who's watching online, uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in. It's really uh, fun for me to uh, share my experience with everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much, Adam. And thank you, everybody on Falco who made this possible. Uh, I think Kevin is behind the scenes, our multimedia correspondent who puts out the videos and some of the blogs that we talked about earlier. He's helping run the show over there. We also have a lot of folks that make, as Adam talked about, we have uh, uh, the internet possible through satellite transmission. So we have a lot of ETOs and electricians and technological officers who make that happen. So thank you, everybody on Falcor. Thank you, everybody on the mainland for um, for showing up and, and participating, asking questions. If you do have further questions, again, we're online at www.schmidtocean.org. You can contact us there, send us questions, um, keep track of what's going on via the blogs. Adam's been writing blogs as well, so it's not just the scientists that are telling what's going on. Adam's also given us his perspective, as well as the videos that Kevin's making. Um, and then again, we also have sort of smaller updates via Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And all of those, our handle is at Schmidt Ocean. So thank you very much to everyone. And we hope to see you online. Take care.